Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm really excited to be here today to talk to you about wellness law. That's what I coined. Um, it really doesn't exist, but um, in my mind, it does. And there are a dozen laws out there that impact workplace wellness program design. We're going to focus on three of those laws, well, four, HIPAA, the Affordable Care Act, which I count really as one conglomerate, uh, the uh, Americans with Disabilities Act, and GINA. And in time permitting, we might dive into a couple of others briefly uh, of, of other laws. Um, but uh, we will be talking about the Flambeau case, in case any of you were wondering, um, and the implications of that decision, especially on the uh, proposed rules for the Americans with Disabilities Act. I want to remind you uh, that in your materials, in case you haven't noticed, you have an article that I wrote on the Flambeau decision as well as a compliance checklist. It is not an exhaustive list. It does not constitute legal advice, but it's a good starting point for you to take with you as you leave today to evaluate your wellness program and see if there are any um, items that are triggered from what we talk about today. But before we dive into the law, uh, I want to ask if any of you are suffering from compliance anxiety, don't feel alone. Statistically, there are a lot of people who feel anxiety, especially HR professionals who have to deal with all these employment laws. Studies have shown about half of them feel anxious about whether they're in compliance. But I'm here to tell you there is a cure, and that is preventive law. And that is, also, that is a legitimate um, discipline. They teach it in law schools. And what it's really about is taking charge of the law, and knowing what, how, what to do to address the, its requirements up front, rather than reacting to accusations of non-compliance later. And one of its primary tenets is to know the purpose of law. Why does that law, that particular law, exist? Uh, and in the world of workplace wellness program laws, many, many of those laws exist for these reasons, to prevent discrimination, and prevent insensitivity to a person's needs, including their need for privacy, but also to provide people with equal opportunities to participate in workplace activities and earn any rewards. Because we can't all be triathletes, but we all want to feel good. So, one of the preliminary questions you need to ask before you even start determining whether your wellness program is in compliance and ultimately to help people feel good is to determine whether your program is a group health plan. And it can be a group health plan generally in one of two ways. It can be part of an existing group health plan that a benefit that you offer your employees and offered to those employees who are enrolled in the plan. Or it can be a group health plan on its very own. And for those plans that are uh, group health plans on their own, how do you know? How do you know if it's a group health plan? Well, a group health plan is an employee-sponsored welfare benefit uh, that provides medical care to employees and dependents uh, directly or through insurance. What is medical care? That's really the key term. Medical care um, regards an individual's physical condition or state of health or relates to the relief or alleviation of a health or medical problem. It might help to talk about what medical care is not, however. Medical care is not a program um, that furthers general good health, things like fitness classes or nutrition classes that aren't tied to any underlying diagnosed condition that aren't prescribed by a physician. Those things are not medical care. And if your program is really focused, wellness program is really focused around those types of activities, it wouldn't qualify as a group health plan. 
Why do we care if it's a group health plan? Well, here, this chart might tell you. If you can look um, on my right, your left, the group health plan laws uh, are much more, it's a longer list than the non-group health plan laws. And I'll note that in the group health plan column, HIPAA and the Affordable Care Act are listed. And that's the first law, the first two laws we'll be talking about. Uh, I understand you, many of you in this room probably have heard and um, already understand the HIPAA and Affordable Care Act, non-discrimination rules when it comes to wellness programs. But for those of you who might not, um, or those of you who might feel like you need a, a little bit of a refresher, we'll go through these, not spending too much time, but I do have two little test questions at the end of this segment, just to see where, see how well we understand the rules. So, um, generally speaking, HIPAA non-discrimination prohibits um, discrimination by group health plans. Remember, we're talking about now a wellness program that's part of a group health plan or a, a group health plan on its own merit. Um, discriminating based on health factors. Um, there is an exception, however, for wellness programs. Those wellness programs, if they follow certain rules, can vary benefits, including cost sharing, based on whether a person meets um, standards of a wellness program. Uh, just quickly, the Affordable Care Act. So those HIPAA non-discrimination wellness program rules were in existence since 2006. The Affordable Care Act made some changes to those rules, and these are the uh, primary changes. They first moved the rules into statute. Um, they also increased the reward from 20% of the total cost of coverage to 30% of the total cost of coverage and added a 50% uh, allowance, maximum incentive for tobacco use prevention programs. And it also added some stricter requirements for health contingent plans. And we'll talk about the meaning of some of those terms that I just used in a moment for those of you who may not be familiar with them. Uh, so to qualify for a wellness program exception, that is to be able to discriminate based on a health factor um, through a wellness program, the program has to meet certain conditions. Um, and the law divides those programs up into two categories. There's participatory programs, um, and under HIPAA Affordable Care Act, those only need to be offered to similarly situated individuals. There is no limit on the financial incentives that can be offered for those. And then the other category are health contingent programs, and those programs have to meet a five-factor test in order to qualify for this uh, discrimination exception. Um, how you distinguish between participatory and health contingent programs is whether the program is, um, whether the reward for the program is uh, tied to health status. In other words, um, if in order to perform a wellness activity or to meet a standard, your health status is a factor, then the program is essentially a health contingent program. So let's just cover uh, or tie up the loose ends on the participatory category of programs. Those um, are some examples are listed here. These examples are actually right in the law. Fitness center membership reimbursements, rewards for participating in a health assessment, waiving health plan cost sharing for preventive items or services, smoking cessation program reimbursement without a requirement that you actually stop smoking to get the reimbursement. Um, or a reward for attending a health education seminar. None of those, act none of those activities require your health status um, to be involved in participation. Um, for health contingent programs, there are two types of those, activity and outcomes-based. Both of those need to meet a five-factor test, and we'll talk about that five-factor test in a moment. The one key difference between the activity and the outcomes-based programs is for the activity-only programs, a plan can seek a physician verification if the employee can't meet, uh, it says they can't meet that activity because of a health condition. You can ask that employee to go get a verification from the physician. For an outcomes-based program, 
The plan cannot seek a physician's verification if the employee says they can't meet that initial standard. So what are some examples of activity only programs? Walking programs, fitness programs, diet programs. Those are activity only health contingent programs. Outcomes based examples are um, smoking cessation programs where you have to actually quit smoking um, to earn the reward. Uh, you have to have a certain blood cholesterol level, certain BMI, certain blood glucose level, certain blood pressure. The reward is tied to meeting those standards. As I said, both activity only and health contingent programs have to meet a five factor test. And what is that five factor test? The first factor is you have to be able to qualify for the reward as the employee or participant at least once a year. The total reward cannot exceed 30% or if it's a tobacco cessation program or component, 50% uh, of the total cost of coverage. Um, the program has to be reasonably designed to promote health or prevent disease. That is a familiar phrase um, that you'll be hearing when we talk about ADA and GINA as well. The full reward has to be available to all similarly situated individuals, and it is within this factor that the reasonable alternative standard requirement exists. So uh, a plan has to provide a reasonable alternative standard or waive the initial standard if the employee um, requires one and, and requests one. Uh, and then finally, uh, you have to disclose the, re the availability of a reasonable alternative standard or a waiver of that standard in your plan materials um, that describe the wellness program terms, and those would be things like the summary plan documents, and any communications that you um, provide to an employee that discloses to them that they did not meet the initial outcomes-based standard. <coughs> Some other pointers um, of interest with regard to the Affordable Care Act um, HIPAA rules is that if you have, I get these questions a lot, if you have an employee who is in a reasonable alternative standard um, program and they don't meet that stand, reasonable alternative standard until the end of the calendar year or end of your plan year, um, do they get are, they have to qualify for the reward, the full reward for that plan year. How, how can you distribute that? And the answer is in the preamble to the, to the rules, and they say you can pay them the reward in the next calendar year, but it should be in a lump sum. You can't extend it all, you know, pro rata throughout the next year. It has to be soon after, soon within that next calendar year. Uh, you have to, it's, if your reasonable alternative standard, for example, is an education program, you have to help employees find a program like that, and you have to pay for that program. And then um, your reasonable alternative standard should have a reasonable time commitment, and in the rules it says a nightly one-hour class would not be a reasonable time commitment. So here's our first test. It's so easy, I hope. Softball. ABC Health System offers an annual wellness program consisting of an HRA and biometric assessment. As employees are, and covered spouses who participate in um, both those tests receive a reduced health insurance premium. Is this a participatory or a health contingent program? I hear participatory, and you're right, it is. Uh, but one more. This is the only one where I have two questions. The others have just one. ABC Health System contacts a wellness pro all wellness program participants whose health risk assessment or health assessment biometric results indicate some health risk. The purpose of the contact is to offer the at-risk participants health coaching services. If the participant refuses coaching, he or she loses a $50 per pay period in premium savings until he or she engages with the coach. Is this participatory or health contingent? Health continue. Very good. So you guys are are really up on your HIPAA knowledge. Um, yes, because um, de the definition of health contingent um, is it, it requires a someone um, because of a health factor to earn the reward. So in this case, they're identifying those people who had certain um, results in their screenings to participate in coaching, and they have to do that in order to. 
earn the reward. Now, a follow-up question for you is, um, if it's health contingent, um, what else needs to be done? Yeah, and, that, and, and I actually had this question. This is a real-life question. Um, a reasonable alternative standard would need to be offered, although in reality, um, going to a health coaching class, you know, the reasonable alternative standard is offered to people who, because of a health condition, can't do the initial standard. So the person who would be requesting a reasonable alternative standard from coaching would have to have show that they uh, had a medical condition that made them incapable of attending a coaching session. Um, so another question for you, could the plan seek a physician verification for that? If an employee came up to them and said, I can't make the coaching because of a health condition, could the plan say, well, we'd like to see your physician verify that? Yes. Yes. Because this is an activity only. And remember, they can seek physician verification for those um, circumstances. Would it have to meet other five, the other five fact, or four factors? Um, the 30% in maximum incentive? Yes. All those would come into play, even though more than likely most people will be able to meet this coaching standard. So, all right. Let's move on to the more fundamental laws, ADA and GINA. <laughs> I say that a little bit sarcastically. <laughs> Just because of all the activity that's going on. Um, so the Americans with Disabilities Act. Uh, before we get into the proposed rules, which I'm sure you all heard, that were released in April of last year, and then the Flambeau case, which um, impacts those proposed rules, let's talk about the basic requirements of the ADA. So the ADA prohibits discrimination uh, by employers on the basis of a disability in regards to the terms, conditions, and privileges of employment. Um, discrimination includes requiring medical examinations or making inquiries as to whether an employee has a disability unless such exam or inquiry is related to their job or consistent with business necessity. And remember, there's always the requirement that the employer provide an equal opportunity for disabled employees to participate in programs and offer reasonable accommodations. So we said discrimination includes um, requiring medical exams. What are medical exams? Medical exams include procedures or tests that seek information on an employee's health. Um, and this pro prohibition on medical exams applies uh, regardless of whether an employee is disabled, so to all of your employees. Now, in, in addition to the exception for business related or job necessity, you can ask those medically related questions. You can also ask medically related questions under the ADA if it's part of a voluntary, voluntary wellness program. <clears throat> now, before the proposed rules came out last April, we really didn't have a whole lot of guidance of what they meant by the EEOC, which is the agency that enforces the ADA, meant by a voluntary. Um, all they said was that um, a program is voluntary if it doesn't require participation or penalize people who do participate. And one other basic parameter for the ADA is that safe harbor provision, which doesn't get discussed a lot um, by the EEOC. <laughs> but it, it does exist, and we'll see why it's important in a moment. Um, this safe harbor um, allows uh, bona fide benefit plans, group health plans, to ask medical-related questions, conduct medical exams, um, for, and it doesn't matter if the exam is voluntary or not. If the exam is for um, underwriting risks, classifying risks, or administering such risks. And it was this safe harbor that saved the day for Broward County in the 11th Circuit case from a few years ago, Seth B. Broward County. And it is this safe harbor that won the day in the Flambeau case, which we'll be talking about in a little bit. 
So keep this safe harbor in mind. Um, basically, in the Broward County case, um, the court said the, that which the wellness program involved a biometric screen and a health risk assessment. And then the employer used the results of that to channel people with certain risks into disease management programs. Um, and they also used the information for administering their plan. And the court said, well, because you are using this wellness program as part of your group health plan, um, the safe harbor applies, and um, they didn't even get into the discussion um, of whether that program was voluntary or not. They didn't need to. The safe harbor precluded the need to look at the voluntary nature of the, of the program. But before we move on to discussing the Flambeau case, uh, let's talk about the proposed rules. They predate the Flambeau decision. They were issued on April 16, 2015. They are not final rules, they're proposed rules. So there is no requirement that you comply with these proposed rules. However, um, the EEOC said in guidance that you're not going to be penalized, of course, if you comply with these rules. So it's important to know what they are, right? Uh, and the proposed rules really provide three primary changes to the Americans with Disabilities Act with regard to wellness programs. It aligns the ADA and with the ACA, Affordable Care Act, by imposing a 30% incentive maximum. Uh, it imposes that incentive limit on participatory programs. Remember I said under the ACA and HIPAA, there was no limit to financial inducements under participatory programs. That only applied to health contingent programs. Well, the ADA imposes this limit on participatory programs. And it requires employee notice regarding medical information collection and privacy security protections with regard to wellness information. So they're big on privacy and security. If you're going to be collecting health information from employees, you better have some privacy and security policies and procedures in place. So going through each of these major changes, the 30% maximum incentive applies to group health plans only. So there we have another trigger. Are we a group health plan or not? Because if we're not, then this rule doesn't really apply to us. Um, so these proposed rules apply to group health plans, um, and they, are, they apply to participatory programs that involve health risk assessments or biometric screens. So the maximum incentive applies to those types of activities. There is a special rule, I guess, for tobacco cessation programs. Um, the EEOC, remember under the ACA, you had a 50% maximum incentive um, for smoking cessation, programs that included smoking cessation. With the ADA, you have now a 30% maximum incentive. So which one applies? Um, and the EEOC tried to explain that if your smoking cessation program is merely asking someone if they still smoke <coughs> in order to qualify for the reward, you can apply the Affordable Care Act 50% maximum. But if your wellness program, smoking cessation program, um, does like a blood screen, um, an actual medical exam to determine whether the person is um, still using nicotine, then you have, you're limited to the 30% maximum because that qualifies as a medical exam, whereas merely asking someone if they smoke doesn't qualify as a medical exam. So that's the delineation that they have in the proposed rules. The proposed rules also um, prohibit um, plans from denying or limiting coverage to non-participants. And this, to me, is a clear reaction to the court cases that the EEOC uh, brought, um, one being you know, Flambeau, the other being Honeywell and, and, and Orion Energy, where in those cases, employees, who were de employees were denied coverage or had limitations on their coverage um, if they refused to participate in the health risk assessment or biometric screen. Group health plans that collect medical information must employ, provide employees with notice. So here's that other um, big overarching change, the notice requirement. Um, this notice um, has to have, meet certain requirements. 
Um, it has to be understandable, it has to describe the types of information obtained and for what it will be used and how the employer will protect it. Um, the EEOC also expects employers and vendors to protect health information confidentiality. Um, and group health plans um, should abide by HIPAA privacy and security rules. In fact, they talk about some best practices such as separating those who handle the health information um, from those who make employment related decisions and using a third party vendor can help with that separation. Employers and vendors should have clear privacy policies and procedures uh, related to medical information, collection, storage, and disclosure, and you should be training your employees on this. And here's that phrase again, the pr proposed rules require the wellness program to be reasonably designed to promote health and prevent disease. You should not be just about collecting health information. There should be more. There should be another follow-up component, such as health coaching, um, involved with your program. And as always, the ADA requires um, employers to plans to provide reasonable accommodations or equal opportunity um, to participate. So, and this includes participatory programs, if you have, for example, um, a nutrition class and you have employees with maybe hard of hearing, you should think about maybe having a sign language interpreter uh, as part of that class. Or if you're distributing uh, wellness program materials to for the employees to read and you have employees who are maybe visually impaired think about how you can get them access to those materials like larger print or computer discs um, <clears throat> so the EEOC wants you to be thinking about making sure this is as inclusive as possible and they remind us that compliance with the ADA rules does not mean compliance with other laws and we'll if we have time, we'll talk about some of those other laws. We definitely will be talking about Gina um, in a little while. But before we do that, let's talk about flambeau. Um, <clears throat> so I think the flambeau decision turns these proposed rules that we just sort of talked about kind of on their head. Um, flambeau uh, was an employee-only program tied to their group health plan. Uh, they required biometric testing and health risk assessments uh, and health insurance was offered to only those employees who completed those tests. Uh, but it, those completion of those tests was not a condition of employment, it was just a condition of getting coverage. Um, the employer also sponsored weight loss competitions, vending machine modifications and other organizational life changes so the health and risk assessment and biometric screen were part of a larger wellness plan. The company used this information collected from the biometric screens and health risk assessments to identify health risks and common medical conditions, to estimate the cost of providing insurance, to set premiums, to evaluate the need for stop loss insurance, and to adjust copays. And except for tobacco use, the information um, was provided to Flambeau in the aggregate. They didn't see any visually identifiable information. The court found in favor of Flambeau, and this is my former boss, Judge Crabb, who wrote the opinion, um, and she applied the safe harbor that we talked about that law on the day in Sethby Broward County. Um, and just as a reminder, that safe harbor allows employers to establish or administer terms of a bona fide benefit plan based on underwriting risks, classifying risks, and administering such risks. Um, and the wellness program, just as in Sethi, Broward County, was viewed as a term of the benefit plan. Now the EEOC tried to argue, well, if it was a term of the benefit plan, then why, why wasn't it in the summary plan document? Uh, it should have been in there, you know, but it wasn't. It wasn't described at all. And um, the court said it didn't, it didn't matter um, that it wasn't in there or in the collective bargaining agreement. There's some general language in the summary plan document that said, you know, we can administer the program how we see fit, you know, and so they, the court thought that was satisfactory enough to allow for uh, the wellness program term. The judge rejected the EEOC's argument that the application of the safe harbor renders the ADA voluntary medical exam exception irrelevant. That's been the EEOC's position 
Um, if you read the, the footnotes and the proposed rules for the ADA, that's really the only place where they talk about the safe harbor. And they, at that time, said, you know, the Seth B. Broward County case was wrongly decided because if you, if you ignore the voluntary medical exam exception and allow health, group health plans to um, uh, basically seek cover under the safe harbor, it will nullify the meaning of the voluntary medical exam exception. So in their view, this safe harbor that won the day in these two cases really should only be applied to actuarial studies. I mean, that's their position, um, it, and not to wellness programs. Um, but the Flambeau Court, Judge Crabb, thought that um, this wellness program, because of the way they were using this health information that was gathered, it was part of the group health plan, it was tied to being able to enroll in the group health plan, that it was a term of the group health plan and therefore the safe harbor applied. And this language um, that Judge Crabb used, she said, the difference between the safe harbor and the voluntary medical exam exception is obvious. The safe harbor applies when medical exams are tied to group health plans. Voluntary medical exam exception applies when the medical exams are not tied to group health plans. So again, emphasizing the utmost importance of knowing whether your wellness program is tied to a group health plan. Uh, Judge Crabb also stated in her opinion, and this is why I think um, the EEOC proposed rules are really undermined, um, she recognized, because remember, this decision, I should have said, came out on December 31st, um, so New Year's Eve. Um, and she said, um, the EEOC's proposed rules do not address how the ADA insurance safe harbor applies to medical exams that are not part of a group health plan. The only place where they mention the safe harbor is in that footnote that I mentioned. Um, the EEOC may be correct that relying on the ADA insurance, insurance safe harbor is, is not appropriate for standalone wellness programs that are not part of a group health plan and they're unrelated to administration of insurance risks. But that wasn't what was happening in Flambeau. So what are some lessons that we can take from the Flambeau decision? Um, the EEOC's proposed rules, I think, are kind of at stake um, that were issued back in April. They addressed group health plan medical exams only, but didn't really talk about how those interface with the safe harbor, insurance safe harbor that exists in the ADA. And now you have two courts that have said that safe harbor applies in these cases, um, and they didn't really address it. So um, when they're going to come with, uh, back with final rules is a question. Um, and if I were them, I would be thinking about how can we, how can we adjust these, these rules to, um, to address some of the, the issues raised in these cases that are clearly impeding what we think is the, the right um, decision. Um, so what can you do going forward with these, with the, the lessons learned from Flambeau is um, you, you know, make sure that if you have a, a group health wellness program that if you can tie it to the group health plan, you know, you might be able to benefit from the safe harbor, but still recognize that risks exist if you, if you do that. Um, you know, you're still, you're still subject to GINA, um, and we'll talk about GINA in a minute. You should recognize that the EEOC may appeal this decision. I mean, they can appeal it because they still feel so strongly that um, this voluntary medical exam section of the ADA needs to have some teeth, and these court cases are really um, undermining that, um, that, that option. Uh, and that um, mandatory, and you should also think about whether man mandating um, participation through, you know, it's either you participate and get coverage or you don't, if that's still uh, <coughs> providing an optimal work environment for your employees. Um, <clears throat> and um, you should also remember that even though the safe harbor is there under the ADA, it does say in the law that you can't use it as a subterfuge to evade the purpose of the ADA, which is to not discriminate based on disability. So um, just keep those things in mind as, as you're going forward. Now, 
Flambeau was one of three cases. The Honeywell case settled. We have a decision now, Flambeau. Orion Energy in the Eastern District of Wisconsin is the only other case that's pending. I tried to look this morning um, if, uh, you know, to get a sense of when we might get a decision, and I couldn't get on to PACER, so I apologize. But the last time I looked, my guess was it would be later this year that we might see something. Um, Orion Energy is similar to Flambeau, so it'll be interesting if the Eastern District does issue an opinion and they don't settle beforehand. It's an employee-only program with a health risk assessment and a fitness component. Um, employees were required to use a range of motion machine in the fitness room, and the HRA asked medical history questions. Non-participants were required to pay the entire premium, so just like in Flambeau, and there was also a $50 month pen dollar a month penalty for refusing the fitness component. So let's test our knowledge on ADA. Employees or spouses who refuse to enroll in ABC Health System's wellness program, that is, they refuse to take a health assessment or a biometric test, are offered only one plan option, a consumer-driven plan with a high deductible. They also forgo an employer HSA contribution and must pay a $50 per pay period more in premium. Assume that this incentive to participate is more than 30% of the total cost of coverage. Is this permissible under the ADA? It's kind of a trick question because it's a moving target. <laughs> Again, Another real example, though, it was very hard to counsel clients when you have a moving target like this. Under the proposed rules, no, this would not be permissible because it exceeded 30% max. I mean, I threw that in there as sort of a bone. You know. It's not under the proposed rules. But what's the status of the proposed rules now, especially under Flambeau? This is a group health plan, plan program. And uh, we can only assume, we can assume, that they're using this wellness program to administer their plan. Um, so one could make the argument that the safe harbor applies. But at the same time, uh, you know, there are only, let's say there's two different health plan options. One's like a really nice Cadillac type of plan. We won't get into the Cadillac tax, but and the other is the consumer-driven plan, and if you don't participate, you have to go to the consumer-driven plan, even though you wanted the other plan. Is this a subterfuge to avoid the, um, uh, to evade the um, true, you know, goal of the ADA, which is to prohibit discrimination based on, you know, disability? Someone could make that argument. It's probably not a good idea. At the bottom, at the end of the day, a situation like this, this is probably a risky strategy, um, even though the law isn't really clear. You know, there there are some things that you can kind of take into account that maybe aren't part of the law, but just part of you know your employee morale. So it should always be factoring in um, to when you're making decisions like this. So uh, just something for you to think about uh, how this goes moving forward. So let's talk about Gina. The Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act has two titles that um, apply in the wellness program context. Title I applies to group health plans. Title II applies to employers. What is genetic information? Genetic information includes the manifestation of disease or disorder in family members. So things like family, asking about family medical history, which can be discerned from questions from um, health risk assessment to employees or biometric screens of, them, of family members of employees. Families include, family members include spouses and adopted children, so not just family by, um, by blood, but also by uh, relationship. And that definition, by the, way, by the way, applies to both titles, Title I and Title II group health plans and employers. Title I generally prohibits group health plans from requesting, requiring, or purchasing genetic information for underwriting purposes or in connection with open enrollment. Underwriting purposes include things like um, offering premium differential mechanisms in return for completing an HRA or participating in a wellness program. So plans 
that tie financial incentives involving plan contributions to completing a health risk assessment or a biometric screen that seek genetic information can violate GINA, as well as seeking genetic information in connection with open enrollment. Title II prohibits employers from discriminating against employees or applicants because of genetic information. And EEOC enforces GINA Title II, not Title I. Now, under Title II, there's an exception for voluntary wellness programs. This is very similar to the ADA issue, even though we don't have a case like Flambeau to kind of highlight some of these contentious issues. This is very similar. We have a voluntary wellness program exception in Title II. We have a separate um, section for, that deals with group health plans. Many employers have their um, programs run through group health plans. Um, so anyway, under Genome Title II, individuals have to provide prior knowing voluntary and written authorization if they're going to provide genetic information to you. And for the employee, that would be family medical history information. Um, that authorization can be electronic. It has to describe what genetic information will be obtained and the purposes for which it will be obtained and that individually identifiable information is not accessible to coworkers or supervisors. You can offer financial, as an employer, you can offer financial inducements to complete an HRA that includes questions about family medical history or other genetic information, but you have to make clear that the inducement's available regardless of whether the participant answers the question. And you still have to provide that notice um, or that authorization. So, to boil it down for you, sorry, um, GINA compliance red flags are raised if wellness programs have two elements. They have family medical history questions in their HRAs of employees or family members, such as part of, um, or they take biometric screens of family members, like spouses or dependents, and, and there's a financial incentive tied to participating in those, those programs. If you have those elements, you might want to take a closer look, just to be sure that it's in compliance with GINA. Now, we were lucky. We got proposed rules on October 30th. We were waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting for those rules, and they finally came through on their promise, EEOC did, and issued those rules um, late October. And so we have a little bit more guidance on, at least with GINA and wellness programs. Uh, and again, these are proposed rules, not final. Um, not sure when the final rules will come out. Um, and it, just like the ADA proposed rules, you don't have to comply, but the EEOC has said, you can go ahead and comply, and you won't be penalized. So just keep that in mind. Um, and essentially, what these proposed rules uh, allow our group health plan wellness programs to offer incentives for an employee's spouse to provide certain information. That information is limited to the spouse's own current or past health status, which would be genetic information, because it's it's information about the manifestation of disease in a family member, and remember that's the de definition of genetic information. Um, the spouse has to be included in group health plan coverage, and it has to be part of a health assessment or medical exam, um, or both. The proposed rules require a prior knowing voluntary and written authorization for the spouse. The employee does not need to sign this authorization, just the spouse. The authorization has to contain several elements, like the description of confidentiality protections of the information and a statement of the restrictions on disclosure of genetic information. There are no incentives. The proposed rules do not allow incentives for obtaining current or past health, past health status information from an employee's child. This only applies to spouses. Like the ADA rules, like the ACA rules, the incentive is limited to 30% of the total cost of coverage for the plan in which the employee and dependents are enrolled. Um, and they give an example of how to calculate that um, incentive amount. Essentially, if they're enrolled in a family plan, um, you can take 30% of that, and if it was $14,000 for the family and $6,000 for the, for the single coverage, 
you could have $4,200 of incentives that could be offered under GINA for collecting genetic information. But you have to break it down even further. So if you want the spouse, incentivize the spouse to provide that current or past health status, how much of an incentive can you give that the employee for the spouse's participation? Take the 4,200, which is 30% of the family total cost of family coverage, and you subtract 30% of the total cost of single coverage for the employee. Um, in this case, $6,000 is the total cost, so 30% of that is 1,800. So you take 4,200 minus 1,800, and you get $2,400. That's the total incentive that you can offer the employee for their spouse's participation in a health risk assessment or biometric screen that's getting their spouse's health status. And then you can offer the employee for their participation in the wellness program in $1,800. So that's the example given in the rules. Other provisions of note in the rules is obtaining health status information must be part of a wellness program that's reasonably designed to promote health or prevent disease. That's the third time we've heard that phrase. Again, you can't just have a program that's there to collect the information and then do nothing with it. You have to have some sort of follow-up component. Health coaching, disease management, whatever it might be, it has to be, that's what they view, the EEOC views as something that's reasonably designed to promote health or prevent disease. Um, and the program can't be overly burdensome or a subterfuge for violating the law. So here's some helpful tips for avoiding GINA non-compliance. Do not tie financial incentives to participation in a health risk assessment or biometric screen of an employee's children. Current or past health status information of a spouse is okay under the proposed rules. Do not ask employees family medical history questions. If you do ask them the those questions, though, get their written authorization. Um, and don't tie financial rewards to answering those questions. Those incentives should be available regardless of whether they answer those questions. And ask the questions after open enrollment. Oh, here's a test. Our last one. <laughs> All right, ABC Health System. Health risk assessment, health assessment. Ask the employee family medical history questions and screens that employee's spouse to determine current health status. Employees or spouses who refuse to participate in the health assessment or biometric screen, which are administered in conjunction with open enrollment, are offered only one plan option, a consumer-driven plan with high deductible. They also forgo an HSA contribution and must pay the $50 per pay period more in premium. Soon this incentive is more than 30% of the total cost of coverage. Is it permissible under GINA? No, no. Not under the proposed rules. Then we can break it down for the employee. What problems do you see? Anyone? I know I hear some whispers. I don't hear the what is the main said, but there's family medical history questions of the employee. Um, and so we just talked about how you shouldn't be asking those questions. If you do, don't do it within you know open enrollment. Don't tie financial incentives to that. Um, make sure that the incentive would be available regardless. Uh, for the spouse, you can tie the reward now under the proposed rules. You can tie an incentive to the spouse providing their current or past health status, but in this case, the incentive exceeds that 30% maximum that the proposed rules provide. And it's also done also in conjunction with open enrollment, which Gina doesn't permit group health plans to do. So, um, so there's some problems with, with this structure. And again, real life example. So I'm not making it up. Okay, so let's see, how are we are out of time? Oh, we're all, we're all set. Yeah, okay. So these last few slides um, just deal with some other federal and state laws. They are, they're obviously not as busy. <laughs> <laughs> with these laws, uh, the government anyway, um, with regard to wellness programs, but they do pose some risks. A Fair Labor Standards Act essentially, you know, requires you to pay for um, employees for time worked, and if your wellness program is mandatory or you're mandating that they attend certain things as part of your wellness program, 
and you're not paying them, you could have a Fair Labor Standards Act claim. The ADEA, the Age Discrimination and Employment Act, is just asking you to be sensitive to those employees who are age 40 or more because they have a protected class under the ADEA. So if you have a wellness program, that may be difficult for your older workers to um, earn rewards. Um, make sure you account for that. Uh, Title VII. Uh, protects employees um, on the basis of race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. Race and sex are usually the, type, the categories or protected classes that are implicated in wellness programs. Women have different um, standards than, than men when it comes to BMI or cholesterol levels. So make sure you're counting for that. Pregnancy. Um, as, and then for race, you know, some people may have, because of their religion, have the you know, an unwillingness to participate in anything that where they have to get poked in their skin um, or blood drawn. And so make sure you account for that. And then the Internal Revenue Code trips people up sometimes because they're, just like with um, medical care and group health plans, tax benefits flow to medical care. And a lot of wellness programs aren't medical care, they're lifestyle um, choices. And so um, if you're giving rewards for lifestyle choices that would be taxable income. Cash rewards, regardless of the amount, are taxable. Um, so make sure you understand your tax obligations when it comes to wellness programs. And then state laws, I think workers' compensation issues present really interesting problems. Um, and then there's um, scope of practice and other types of state laws that get implicated. So just, again, a lot of different issues and um, that is all I have for you. I'm happy to take questions if, we're, if there's time. Thank you.